Hello everyone and welcome to another video from us here at Digital Collection on computer history. Now, normally I tend to make videos about important and seminal computers and consoles um, uh, throughout the uh, computer history, um, but this one here is a little gem that um, warrants a few minutes of presentation. So what we have here is a uh, Tandy 1400 uh, LT. Now, Tandy started making the 1400 uh, series in 1987, and by the time uh, the production ended, a few years later, they came up with three versions. So there's the 1400 LT, which is this one, the original one, and then there is the 1400 uh, FD, an improved uh, version, and the, finally the 1400 HD, which contain a hard disk. And we'll, we'll mention a little bit about that later. But let's just put it a little bit in perspective. So the year is 1987. It's already been two years since Intel released uh, possibly their most important processor of the 80s, uh, the Intel 8386. Now that processor was a 32-bit processor. It had things like uh, protected mode, um, it had virtual mode, it could access 4 gigabytes of memory, and it was somewhere between 20 to 30 times faster than the original uh, Intel 88 processor that was in the IBM PC machines. So, this machine right here can do none of that. Um, and on top of that, the price at the time that Tandy was charging for it was in the ballpark, ballpark of $1,600, which in nowadays money it's around you know $3,600. Not cheap. So, why would you buy it? Well, as it turns out, there are actually good reasons for that. Well, for one, for example, it is uh, a, a perfect IBM, almost perfect IBM clone machine, which a lot of portables at the time were not really. Um, they were IBM clone-ish, but they had specialized hardware, uh, the processor wasn't a typical one, uh, and so on and so on. This actually is IBM compatible, which means it, it, it was had access to a large library, by 1987 it was very large, of software games and so on that you would have. Um, what about speed? While it's true that it doesn't have an, uh, a 386 processor inside, it doesn't have an 8088 either. What it has is, is an NEC V20 processor, which could run at two speeds. It could run the original 4.77 MHz to make it fully compatible to an IBM machine, but could also run at a faster speed of 7.16 MHz. Now, what is NEC V20? NEC V20 is a processor that was launched by the Japanese corporation NEC to be um, pin compatible with the original 8088. However, inside the architecture is that of the next generation, which was the 8186. So it has an uh, expanded instruction set, as well as um, uh, it will use less cycles for a lot of instructions, therefore it was faster. Now, when you couple that with the fact that this um, could uh, clock up to 7.16 megahertz, you are now somewhat in the ball, ballpark of a, of a low 8286 processor machine, which is not bad at all. And, and also, um, the, the, the switch between uh, the two fre different frequencies is actually uh, uh, can, can be done via software. So you just power on the machine, uh, you go into settings, and then you, then you, you, you choose a speed. So for faster things, you could, you could up the processor speed. If you want compatibility, go down to 4.77. But that's not all. This little machine here comes equipped with a math coprocessor. That's right, and it has an 8087, and not just an 8087, it has one that is slightly newer than the original math coprocessor released by Intel, and runs at 8 megahertz. So it's pretty fast. Now, if you think about it, around uh, middle to late of 80s, um, very few machines, very few computers, IBM clones or otherwise, would come with a math coprocessor. This did. What about a display? Well, it featured an equivalent to the CGA uh, graphics chip inside. 
It could do either 40 by 25 or, or 80 by 25 uh, character display, 80, um, 80 uh, columns by 25 lines. Um, it could do um, 16 shades of blue on, on the screen that uh, it shipped with it. Uh, but it could also be connected to uh, an external CRT. There are two ways to do that. You could either plug in uh, a DB9 uh, normal CGA monitor that you have, one, one of those, or uh, you could connect it to a um, um, via composite to an actual TV, and we'll, we'll see about that later. Uh, the battery itself, uh, at the time, if you buy a new, uh, it will last for four hours. Now, that is not too shabby even for today's computer, let alone for 1987. Four hours in the field was a long time. Now, it's possible that you, in order for you to get four hours, you, you didn't have to, you, you couldn't go to 7.16 megahertz, but still, four hours is four hours. The keyboard as well is, it's actually a full table keyboard. This is not bad at all. This is not some kind of, um, you know, cheap uh, Atari 400 style keyboard. No, this is a, proper uh, mechanical keyboard and on the back, as you'll see later, it has a, um, uh, a DIN plug to plug in your, um, you know, IBM Model M keyboard or what, 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 what have you. So even though it's portable, if you could connect an external monitor and a, a keyboard, that basically becomes a desktop and not a bad one at that. Uh, it also comes in with an internal modem. 1200 bouts, which now sounds obviously terribly slow, but for the time, 1200 baht modem was not bad, and, it's, and it is included. And then there is this, the manual. Th that's all there is, really. And in fact, half of it is, is just DOS commands. The other half, the last, the, the, that's all the pages you get to tell you about the machine, which means this is all that it sets it apart from a normal desktop IBM clone. So. That's useful because that meant familiarity. It, it meant that people who would buy this machine did not have to learn new commands, um, deal with different mode of operations many laptops at the time suffered from. It was just a normal IBM clone machine. Even, as, even stylistically, uh, it is not bad. In the back, as you can see, uh, all the ports are covered by this nice uh, latch, uh, which you can which you can just flip it up and see everything inside. But if you want to close it, you will have the the, the power, uh, so you can just keep uh, you, you 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 can keep it closed just to get the power in. Now let's try to power it on and boot it up. I have here a uh, Tandy DOS uh, version 3, which is really not much different from Microsoft DOS uh, 3. So I'm going to put the disk inside. Um, I'm going to power it on. It has two uh, floppy drives, A and B. Um, a is where you will boot the operating system from. And B runs your software. Uh, the machine comes with 640 uh, kilobytes of RAM, plus 128 kilobytes, which can be used for um, uh, RAM disks, for example, you could have C, uh, a drive C in those 128 kilobytes. It goes through the um, self-testing and then it'll, it should uh, boot from the disk. There you go. In fact, this one even says Microsoft MS-DOS version 3.2. So there you go, 128 kilobytes RAM. So it, it, it'll actually be, uh, it'll mount a C drive in those 128 kilobytes. Has one stuck key. There you go. And that's it. Um, I have, as I, ha I happen to have here, a uh, Wheel of Fortune game. So if we do that, um, now this screen can do uh, 16 shades of blue. Uh, so it's not great, but for typing, uh, it's not too bad at all. And like I mentioned, you could connect an external display. So there you go.
Now, what if we uh, would like to change the processor speed uh, or other uh, function of the system? Well, they have this handy control alt insert key that you press and you are uh, presented the Tandy 1400LT setup menu and you can change different things, for example uh, internal LCD or outside CRT uh, internal external keyboard, because it has a keyboard connection in the back like I mentioned and of course CPU clock, so you can choose between 7.16 MHz or uh, 4.77 uh, original IBM uh, PC frequency now I want to show you the external uh, CRT connection. So I have it running now on the on the uh, internal display, but I have connected to the um, via composite to the TV in the back, and I'm going to run the same. If you press uh, Control Alt uh, F11, that switches the display from the internal LCD to external CRT, and that is uh, CGA graphics. So now I can run Wheel of Fortune. So, in conclusion, I honestly think this is a fairly interesting machine. Now, it's not important, no, it didn't change the direction of computing throughout the history, it didn't sell a million versions of it, a million copies, but it doesn't mean it didn't achieve what it wanted to do. Um, I mean, it, ha it has speed, it has a, as a, as a, as a NEC V20 processor, it has a math coprocessor, which is so rare at the time. It used to have a 4-hour battery, it has a nice CGA display which can output uh, 16 colors on an external output, it can play many of the games that were released up to and including 1987, and it didn't cost that much. For example, Toshiba at the time had a laptop called uh, the T1200 that uh, was kind of the same, um, two floppy drives, specs, some, some version had a hard disk, uh, that used to go up to $6,000. Uh, whereas this one only cost it only was around uh, 1600 not a bad deal another good machine from Tandy and with that thank you very much for watching and see you next time for another computer history video from us here at Digilock Collection